Thank you for tuning in to Voices for Freedom, an anti-human trafficking podcast. We want to acknowledge that the content we discuss can be emotionally challenging and may evoke strong reactions. The stories we share often delve into tough subjects related to human trafficking, which may be difficult for some listeners to hear. Our goal is to raise awareness and promote understanding of the complexities surrounding human trafficking. Listener discretion is advised. Coming up on Voices for Freedom, an anti-trafficking podcast. Jared Fogle, the former Subway sandwich pitch man, claimed to have lost a lot of weight over the years on the Subway diet plan, had some proclivities. Darren O'Deer um, was one of the investigators. He said, okay, this is Jared Fogle's house. I see the investigators go in and it was, it was the alphabet soup. It was the FBI, the U.S. Postal all Service, the all, agencies, yeah, so all the speak. federal yeah. agencies <laughs> and plus IMPD, the Indianapolis Police Department. The FBI, they told me when I got in there, they said, don't take photographs, don't touch anything, just tell us where the dog indicates, okay. and then you can leave. And the dog indicated by his desk and indicated in a box. So on the news, um, the U.S. Attorney, Steve DeBroda, was on the news and he stated that the dog had found key evidence, had found a thumb drive in one of those two areas that the dog indicated. Welcome to another edition of Voices for Freedom, an anti-trafficking podcast. I'm Matt Osborne, Global Ambassador for Operations and Education at Our Rescue. Today we have a treat. We're coming to you from the road, just outside of Indianapolis, Indiana, in the beautiful Midwestern part of the United States, from the campus of the Hope Center Indy and Jordan Detection Canine. It is my privilege today to be with Todd Jordan, the owner program developer and chief trainer at Jordan Detection Canine. And for many of you who followed our rescue and these amazing canines, well, this is where it all happens. This is where the training happens. This is where the matching of dog and handler occurs. And this is where, for so many of you, your donations help us to ensure that these amazing animals get into the hands of the men and women of law enforcement in the United States and around the world to find the material that hopefully will put these alleged child predators away for a long time. Todd, I'm so excited. Thank you for making time. We'll talk about why we're here this week. You have a lot of dogs and handlers here running around. They're gonna be doing some amazing things. Uh, I've had the chance to talk with you on a few occasions remotely. It's the first time I've gotten to meet you in person. What a privilege. And I think that uh, for our supporters now, just to hear a little bit about your background, right? I joke, I mean, from firefighter to now training dogs that are helping to put child predators away. Would you tell us a little bit about in the past your work with dogs when you were a firefighter, what you were training them to sniff out, and then this transition now to realizing that, wait, electronics can actually have a scent that dogs can detect that maybe humans can't. So Todd, welcome to Voices for Freedom. Well, thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, so I did, I started out as a firefighter. I've been a, I was a firefighter for 33 years. Uh, just recently retired because the dog business got so busy that uh, in February I decided to take the leap to actually start doing this full time. Um, I did start doing fire investigations in, back in the early 90s and worked my way through that. And in 1997, I got my first canine. Uh, it was an accelerant detection canine trained for arson fires. Um, the dogs were indicating on gasoline, kerosene, diesel fuel, things that their people use to set fires. So that's where I got my start. Um, I worked a dog for you know, 20 some years and not the same dog, of course. I had right. worked three different dogs. Um, but within that process, I just, I really fell in love with just training the dogs. I worked with another program, training accelerant canines and really liked doing that and was always looking for the next cutting edge thing. And just through the dog world, I found out that Connecticut State Police had figured out what the chemical was, had trained one other dog um, at the time. And they trained it just for the Connecticut State Police to have and they, for their Internet Crimes Task Force. And that's basically where I heard about it. But wow. as a firefighter, that information really didn't matter to me. I mean, I didn't even realize that human trafficking and um, all the child exploitation things were going on. I mean, it's just one of the, I guess I was one of the naive people throughout <laughs> America that really doesn't know for this. Sure. That information was, was given to me just through, you know, someone called me wanting an accelerant canine that was from Connecticut. They, um, they were talking about how their programs and how they were always in the forefront of, and the tip of the spear with new right. technology and all that. So 
That's the first time I heard about the canines. Didn't think anything else about it until one of my friends was on the Internet Crimes Task Force. Um, was, that a, was that a search warrant? He was there for like eight hours trying to find a micro SD. And I was like, hey, I, I've heard that they can, they have actually found what the chemical is. Right. The chemicals TPPO mm -hmm. and that the dogs can actually indicate on that chemical. And he said, do you think you could train one of these dogs? And that was the first initial thing of me actually trying to figure out how this was working. That is incredible. You know, I tell you, these dogs are just a game changer in a lot of ways that we'll discuss. But these, these dogs are so popular. Uh, I'm a dog person myself. I know so many now listening, watching are. So tell us a little bit, even with the accelerant detection dogs as well, now the electronic storage device dogs, are they food motivated? Are they ball and toy motivated? I imagine a lot of people in the audience say, well, I've heard of a bomb sniffing dog and a drug sniffing dog, but this is the first time perhaps I've heard about firefighters using dogs to detect whether it was arson or not, and then certainly finding electronic storage devices. So talk to us a little bit about what motivates the dogs to work across maybe the different categories of sniffing dogs, if you would. So I do like the food reward method and basically the only time the dog eats is when he works. That doesn't mean we wait on a search warrant to do it. It just means that the, the handler has to train the dog every single day and they have to hide devices that could be found um, and, or accelerants or whatever it is I'm training. But at this, in this case, um, they have to find the electronic storage devices and to get fed. So every time that they find something, they get a little handful of food. They do a daily allowance of three to five cups of food a day, so it's not like we're starving the dogs or getting a, a good amount of food, but it's like an athlete. A doctor will tell an athlete, if you want to lose weight, be healthy, you should eat small meals daily. So that's basically what we do with the dogs. And the dogs are pretty much athletes. And they're in top shape and just are always ready to work. And having the food reward method, they're always on their game. They, right. Because you do this for six years with a play reward dog. If you're throwing that ball for six years, finally after, there's a time when the dog goes, you go get the ball. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to go <laughs> fetch the ball anymore. You go get it. But the dogs will work for food no matter what. Um, my first excel or my second accelerant canine was 13 years old when he retired and he passed away at 15 because of, and I, I solely take that because of the food reward because they had a healthy lifestyle and they led a healthy lifestyle. And so that's why I like the food reward. Also, it keeps the handlers from getting lazy. Yes. They have to feed their dogs yes. every day. They have to train every day. And it's not like some of the play reward dogs where they, um, they go a week, they go two weeks, maybe three weeks before they even, you know, they work their dog and, and it, it's easy to get lazy. It's cool at first, but then once you do it on a day-to-day -day right. basis, the handlers do get kind of lazy. So this keeps them motivated as well as the canine. And I love what you talked about too, and it's important to emphasize, right? All the dog lovers out there, even if they're not working, the dogs will eat. And we heard a story one time from one of your handlers and dogs where two in the afternoon on Sunday, the handler's off watching the ball game or something, some movie on, and the dog then all of a sudden starts going around the house to pull all of the dummy devices, the train device. Here's my cell phone, here's my laptop. Here. Oh, girl, you must be hungry, right? And so I'm sure you've heard a lot of those stories sure. as well. Sure, yeah, no, it doesn't matter if it's Christmas Day or anything. I mean, it's just you always have to train your dog every single day. So perhaps in the audience, to the extent that those before our rescue started broadcasting, before your uh, company got to have prominence, anyone who might have heard of the electronic storage device dog probably heard of the famous or infamous case of Jared Fogle, the former Subway sandwich pitch man, uh, claimed to have lost a lot of weight over the years on the Subway diet plan, kind of got rich and famous, but had some proclivities, had some things, and we can call it for what it is now he's been convicted. But what many people maybe don't know, Todd, is that was your dog, Bear the Wonder Dog, who was able to find that evidence. What can you tell us about the training that you gave Bear? And you mentioned already Connecticut State Police, this idea, correct? of finding out that there was a chemist who had isolated the TPPO compound or component in these electronic storage devices. Tell us about Bear and to the extent you know or found out later, how was Bear used in the Jared case? Because my understanding is the house where this happened was just about a 40 minute drive from where we're sitting right now, correct? Correct, yes. So it, again, it was one of those things where I got this dog trained um, I was going to give it to a, my friend that worked at a police department. Well, his police department decided they didn't want any more canines for a while. So I'm like, well, what's a firefighter going to do with this dog? And, you know, I, I don't have access to search warrants and all that. Well, my wife's best friend um, is a police officer who happens to be the sergeant. I didn't know this. I knew he was a police officer. 
Um, but he was a sergeant for the ICAC task force in, in Indianapolis. So I called him and told him I had this dog. He goes, there's no way you've done this. So <laughs> he had never heard of it before. So he called me to a search warrant. And every time they called me to a search warrant, the dog would find something. And they started believing. So I took a trip down the uh, downtown Indianapolis to the state's attorney's office, did a demonstration for them. Um, they all had poker faces on. They just were looking at me weird. And I was like, okay, this didn't go very well. And as, as we're working the dog, um, they, they decided, and I, far, I didn't even know it, but they were, they were just basically setting it up to where I was doing more search warrants. And so I ended up doing like eight search warrants before the Jared Fogel case. And um, Darren O'Deer um, was one of the investigators. He actually has one of my dogs now, but, okay. um, but he called me and he said, hey, we've got this case. I can't tell you who it is or what's going on with oh, it, wow. but um, could you be in Zionsville and, in the morning? So we go there and he said, okay, this is Jared Fogel's house. Wow. So that was the first time I had heard about it was the morning that, you know, 20 minutes before they hit the house. So we go there and I see the investigators go in and it was, it was the alphabet soup. It was the FBI, the U.S. Postal all Service, the all, agencies, yeah, so all the speak. federal yeah. agencies <laughs> and plus IMPD, the Indianapolis Police Department and all the ICAC task forces. So the state police, and all of them. So they called me in and we started in the basement, which it wasn't a dingy basement. It was a nice basement bar. I mean, just a very nice house and um, had his wall of fame of all the people he had taken pictures with. So that was kind of interesting. But then we worked our way up and the, his office was on the second floor. So it took me a while to get up to it with only having one dog. Okay. And it's such a big area. Um, it's a large house, probably about a five or 6,000 square foot house, maybe bigger. By the time I got up to his office, it, had, it's, it was probably close to noon, one o'clock. And the FBI, they told me when I got in there, they said, don't take photographs, don't touch anything, just tell us where the dog indicates, okay. and then you can leave. And they, I mean, politely, but they were, sure. they wanted me to make sure that I didn't touch anything. Being a firefighter, um, the only way I was allowed to go into that was because we have a re we had arrest powers through for fire investigation okay. through our city police department where I worked. And so that was the only reason they allowed me to go to all these search warrants because of having arrest powers. If not, I would have never been able to yeah. do this. But you had the dog who was trained mm -hmm. and the dog had not indicated on anything, correct? The basement correct. until you'd yeah. gone up to the office. So we got up to his office and we walk in and the dog indicated by his desk and indicated in a box. Um, and again, I just told the agent that was watching to make sure I didn't take any photographs or anything. Yeah. Um, I told him, I said, okay, the dog indicated in two spots. And he goes, okay, thank you. Is there anywhere else you need to search? And I said, not in this office. Um, I did, I think I did the closet. Right. Um, but that was it. And I didn't find anything else. And I left. Um, I go downstairs, I walk out the door and it was a media frenzy. Oh, and there's a picture of me walking out of the door and I'm looking to the right. And I have this look on my face, but it was the oh crap look because I look out and there's hundreds of cameras and I'm looking into the garage going, I'm going that direction out of here because yeah. I didn't want to be questioned about what the dog was doing because they told me to kind of keep Correct. it quiet. Yeah, yes. I go to my vehicle, um, a news media guy follows me over there and I said, you need to talk to Darren. Yeah. And so I sent him over there and Darren tells a good story that someone came up and said, so what kind of dog is that? And he goes, I believe it's a black lab. <laughs> yes. And that's how he left it. That's so, great. so you did not go into the garage. I did go in the garage. Search. I did go in there. And actually, as I'm in there, they asked me to search his vehicle. Okay. I was in there probably 10 minutes when okay. um, his wife and kids came out and they're like, they wanted the vehicle to get out of there. Right, and, for sure. Um, so I didn't stay in there very long. So. But Bear had not indicated on anywhere in the garage. No. It was just the two. Yeah, it was just the two yeah. areas. And then just to wrap up, I and mean, this is incredible to hear this story. I think you were telling me off camera that you didn't really know what they found until later in the news, correct? Right. So on the news, um, the U.S. attorney, Steve DeBroda, was on the news and he stated that the dog had found key evidence, had found a thumb drive in one of those two areas that the dog indicated. And I still don't know where, but... Um, but it was either one of those two, presumably, correct. right? Yeah. Well, that is incredible. Well, thank you for telling that story. We're going to wrap up this first segment, and when we come back, we will talk a little bit more about how our rescue heard about you, vice versa, and how we've been able to partner. But thank you for sharing that story again on Jared Fogel. And just again to emphasize, the human eye can only see so much. The men and women of law enforcement go in and do the best they can, but it's oftentimes these dogs on secondary searches, tertiary searches. This happened to be the first one, but Baird found it. So thank you so much, Todd, for being here. Please don't go anywhere. We will be right back. This is Voices for Freedom, an anti-trafficking podcast brought to you by Our Rescue. 
Big thanks to our sponsor, the Our Rescue Store, for supporting our podcast. The Our Rescue Store is committed to responsibly sourcing products that ignite conversations about human trafficking, raising awareness and contributing to the movement against it. With more than enough colors, designs, and items to choose from, there is definitely something for you. Find something you'll be proud to own and be an advocate for change. Visit store.ourrescue.org and use the promo code VOICES10 for 10% off your purchase. That's VOICES10 on store.ourrescue.org. Welcome back to Voices for Freedom, an anti-trafficking podcast brought to you by Our Rescue. I'm Matt Osborne here on the road in Indianapolis, Indiana, just to the southeast with Todd Jordan, our good friend who is the owner, program developer, and chief trainer at Jordan Detection Canine. In the first segment, we were talking about the training of these amazing dogs, you know, to sniff out electronic storage devices. Uh, thumb drives and SD cards and cell phones, laptops, hard drives, air tags, and so much more. So Todd, now for this next segment, again, we mentioned the Jared Fogle case, the former Subway sandwich pitch man. I will speak personally. I saw, I think, a 2015 report on the Today Show when Bear, your, your wonder dog who you train, found the digital devices of one of the Today Show reporters. We were intrigued. I think either we reached out or somehow connected with you. What was your memory of that first contact from our rescue and how we met you when you were working out of your garage, I believe, right, within a maximum of maybe eight dogs per class, if I remember, to now this unbelievably beautiful facility here uh, in, again, southeast of Indianapolis and how that came about, our partnership and how you're able to train now so many dogs and handlers each year to really fight child exploitation and human trafficking. So OUR um, actually had gone up to Seattle to see what they could do for the police department. And Ian had just gotten Bear. They didn't know that, you know, Bear had ex existed at that point. It was still very fresh at that time. The domestic operations person that went up there, they were just going up to see, hey, is there anything we can do? Is there any equipment you might need? And Ian, who bought the dog from me, um, the detective that was handling him, um, he said, I got to show you something. And so he showed uh, the operations director and they couldn't believe it. They did a demonstration for them and um, immediately Ian calls me and he goes, you're going to be getting a call from OUR. <laughs> and he said, they really are interested in this. And again, I, I didn't know um, in what level they were talking about. They just, when they called, they, um, you guys called, they said that they wanted to do one dog. They wanted to donate a dog to a law enforcement agency and asked if they could do that. And so they came out, they looked at the dogs. I had to meet at a fire station because again, I was working out of my garage and didn't really want to come across that way. I wanted to make sure that, you know, they were seeing the dog in a good environment and everything else, sure. not just my garage. So they came out, they looked at it and they committed to, you know, doing a dog at, in a class. And then it went from one dog to, you know, three dogs a year, maybe for each one in each class. And Sometimes it was, you know, oh, we're going to do five dogs this year, but it was never five dogs. It was always, if they said they were going to do three, it was six. If they said it was five, it was 10. If they said it was 10, it was 20. And it's just, it has grown so much. But because of that, they were like, how many dogs can you do at one time? And I'm like, I can do eight. And they're like, well, why can you only do eight? Yeah. And I was like, because I'm working out in my garage, honestly. And That's they're incredible. like, Oh wow, we, we, need to, we need to figure this out. So again, I didn't know any of this was going on. They went back to OUR, to all the powers to be at that point. They decided that they wanted to um, give money to build a facility. Um, but being a for-profit, they really couldn't give me the money to build a facility. So the Hope Center, Indy, we were already talking about putting a, a dog grooming place here on campus to let the survivors actually work here and maybe giving me a couple kennels that if I had an overflow, if I had eight dogs in my kennels at my garage, maybe have two or three kennels here and they were going to allow that to happen. Um, so as I was talking to Pastor Hubert from the Hope Center, we were talking about it and I said, hey, I said, oh, you are just called me and they want to donate a building and do half of it would be for training canines for the electronics, but the other half would be to do this program that I said, I kind of have an idea with doing a program using the survivors and actually having the survivors work with the dogs, the ones I have in training, and putting the, the therapy aspect, and the, the comfort aspect onto the dogs, but at the same time, they could get their own therapy, you, you know, working with the dogs, and kind of come up with this program for that. 
And he thought it was a fantastic idea. Then when I presented that part to OUR, um, they loved it. And so we did. So they decided they're going to build this building. And we did. We split it right down the middle. Mm -hmm. Half of it's, you know, to train the electronics dogs and it's set up specifically for that. Um, the other half is to, it's like a classroom area that we're using for, you know, the girls can come over. They have a class once or twice a week and they come over and they, they get the dogs I have in training. They bring them over there and they, they train with them and, and use them for their own comfort at the same time. Um, then they decided they're going, we are going to buy a puppy, raise, have one of the girls raise a puppy. Mm -hmm. And they raised a couple of them and they actually became electronics dogs. So some of the yeah. survivors actually did that. Yeah. Um, but the one specifically was to be the mom, or her name was Eve. We're at that point now, the dog is old enough. She's in her first heat that she could have been become a mom, right. but we weren't completely set up yet. We had just gotten the floor done. We're getting the, the kennels built for that. But in the fall, we're going to have, hopefully have the first litter of dogs and that will be trained for electronics and, oh, wow. and all that. So. You get emotional, you know, we, yeah. we don't believe there are any coincidences right in these things. And we've been very blessed throughout our, our organization. But when you look at Eve, right, the mother of all, you know, in this program, for instance, and I mean, the fact that Hope Center Indy and the women they're working with and what these women have gone through, and it dovetails so much with our mission and your mission and this idea of these girls helping when they're puppies, right? And the therapeutic and these dogs um, to then be able now to become the electronic storage device dogs or others. And you mentioned you actually buy the dogs from them, correct? And then obviously our rescue and other sponsor. And that's great too, because it's a source of income for them, right? For jobs, for, I just think that it's amazing how many uh, things that we can do for good in one sort of effort. I, I told them I didn't want to take advantage of the situation. I didn't want to sit there and have you know, the girls training these dogs for free and they just give them to me and then I turn around and sell them. So it was more of a, a thing where we could, they put a lot of work into them. I mean, they have to raise them not only for the eight weeks that they're here as puppies, but then we have to get volunteer puppy raisers right. and they have to raise them for an entire year. Oh, so that means something and that, you know, we should be paying for that. I mean, that's where I get my dogs now are from places that train them with people with disabilities. And I pay a certain amount for the dogs. So I want to pay that same amount that I pay for the dogs for through, through them would pay to the Hope Center as well. And, and then they can give them more work to do and, mm -hmm. and that's just another job. And that's, and that's probably one of the biggest things with the Hope Center that I think is really cool is that they're, they're giving the girls a chance to get out and actually find a, a, a career that, um, and dogs are perfect because you know, if they're grooming dogs, they learn how to be a dog groomer. And dogs really don't care what your past is. They don't care what you look like. All they want to do is get loved on. And so that's just a good, a good avenue to get the dogs um, with the girls and, and all that. I just think yeah. it's, a, it's a full circle. They're training dogs to rescue more people that were in the same situation they were in. Right. For now, for dog lovers out there, they're going to love this. Would you walk us through a little bit on the training process? What type of breed do you choose and how did you choose that? How do you take them from that puppy stage to see whether they are able to be the ESD canines? And then how do you match them with your handlers? I love what you were telling me earlier about and what I read too on your website about personalities, right? Not just the dog, but the handler as well. Can you walk us through that process? Yeah, so most of the dogs I get are one to two years old, um, and I get them from places, like I said, that are training them for people with disabilities. And, um, but rescue dogs to rescue. I love you correct, talking about yeah. that. It's so huge, that yeah. point. But all the dogs there, they've gone through one to two years of training, and, and it's, they're simple things. They may pull too hard on the leash to pull someone around that's visually impaired, or, you know, or they, they're nervous around a wheelchair, and that, that's a lot of dogs will get um, career change because of that. And so things like that, those, that really doesn't matter to me. They, they, they're usually energetic. They may bark at small animals or they mm -hmm. may get distracted easy. And, <laughs> and that's okay in my world. Dogs. All the dogs I get are all Labrador retrievers. Um, they say I'm a lab snob because I really like the good looking English labs with the blocky heads. And, but that's okay. That's just what I like. And so I, well, I'm I not an expert, but the Labrador, the smell as well. I'm sure there are others, but that mix would probably be uh, really well suited for this, wouldn't it? Yeah, and the nose is one thing. The other thing I like about Labradors is nobody's really scared of a lab. You get a pointy ear dog out here, yeah. you know, people start to be intimidated by that. And they're not really going to want to come towards the dog. And I feel like that having a Labrador is something, or a Golden Retriever. I, I train a few Golden Retrievers. Um, but they're, they're just, they're nice dogs. They're happy dogs and they'll do anything for food. They're food, food motivated yes. and they'll do anything for prey. I think that most of these dogs will work for praise 
as much as they would for food. You can give them one kibble and give them a bowl of food and they'd probably be okay with just the praise because all they want to do is please you the whole time that they're with you. So Interesting. As you're watching some of the handlers go through this class, you'll be able to see how their dogs are pretty much paired with them. And um, Chaz and Spike, they're an OUR mm -hmm. team. Long time, we love Chaz those, and Spike. They're one of the two, first ones, Everybody right? said, how did you pair those two together? Because they're exactly, I had a guy call me and he was with Chaz and Spike on a, at some camp, a state police camp, and he goes, this was the best pairing I've ever seen in my life. And, <laughs> a match made in heaven. Yeah, yeah. so it just, they, they say it's a tender for dogs and handlers is what I run, so. Um, but basically, I, I, I go through, I, I, I get to know them a lot on the phone. I talk to the handlers a lot. Um, and then I, I send them a questionnaire and I just ask questions. I mean, normal things like, what's your family life like? Do you have any kids? Do you live in an apartment? Do you live in a house? Um, just little things like that. How does your office work? Do you have your own office? And, and then I ask them just, you know, is there, any, is there any type of dog that you really want? Do you like um, a black lab or a yellow lab or a chocolate lab or male or female? And I try to accommodate that as much as I can, but if I go up there and they only have all males and you want a female, then you may wait or you take a male. Right. Um, so I go through all that with them and, and do a lot of work with the dogs. And like right now for the next class is a month and a half away and I have handlers call me, have you picked my dog out yet? And I'm like, <laughs> not yet. I'm still learning their personality. I've, I've got your personality down. Now I want to see what the dog's doing. And, and I do try to pair that. And now I have 15 dogs in training. So it's taking a little bit longer to try to figure out who's going where and, yeah. and what's going to be the best fit. It's amazing. I'll share one story, one of our amazing handlers in, in Georgia, and you probably know who I'm talking about, but she had said that you had done such a good job pairing her personality with the dogs, but she didn't realize until she was having trouble make, uh, connecting with the dog, and then she's like, wait a sec, how would I act? So she started acting that way, and, the and they just hit it off, and they were good. So whatever you're doing is, is right, and it must be really satisfying for you to see that when these dogs then and handlers start having a lot of success on these secondary and tertiary searches. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it happens. I think it's probably for me, um, the immediate gratification with that, with the arson dog world, you have, you, you have your dog indicate, and then you have to put it in a can and send it to a laboratory and wait six months. Mm -hmm. And with these dogs, you get that, gra that instant gratification. They indicate on a drawer, you open the drawer, there's a the device, take the device, take it out to the, the mobile vehicle where they right. do the crimes forensic stuff and they download it and they have immediate satisfaction that they've caught the person and what they need to do so I do like that a lot better than waiting six months that hopefully the dog was correct where now we For have sure. instant gratification yeah. and you know all of these crimes are worthy of investigation right arson explosion explosives drugs and child exploitation material I heard you say one time and we'll end this segment maybe with your thoughts on this and I'm probably paraphrasing but you mentioned on a drug search, if you miss some drugs, you're not happy about it, but at the end of the day, you just miss some drugs. On these searches, if you miss a storage device with child sex abuse material, images of a victim, that's a whole nother thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's why I try to have a two-week class instead of an eight-week class, because I want these investigators to get back out and actually do the work. And so when they do find a, a small micro SD, I mean, a terabyte of information, micro SDs hold at least a terabyte that right. we know about this. But if you think of each image as a victim, mm -hmm. that's what is important to me. And that's if the dog finds just one, that's good. Right. This is powerful in an exciting way, an emotional way. But thank you so much. We will wrap up this second segment, but don't go anywhere because when we come back, Todd will talk us through why we're here this week in this advanced training class. I got to see some of the scenarios already in the mazes. You will not believe this and won't want to miss it. So stay tuned. You are tuned to Voices for Freedom, an anti-trafficking podcast brought to you by Our Rescue. And I want to thank today's sponsor, the Our Rescue Store, for supporting this podcast. Did you know the Our Rescue store features survivor-made items? In this critical fight, they serve as symbols of hope. By choosing to purchase one of these beautifully handcrafted items, you will impact the healing journey of survivors and help them reclaim their lives in the process. We encourage you to shop survivor-made items on the Our Rescue website. It might only be a few dollars to you, but it makes a world of difference to them. And in case you need any extra motivation, use promo code VOICES10 for 10% off your purchase at store.ourrescue.org. 
That's Voices10 at store.ourrescue.org. And welcome back to Voices for Freedom, an anti-trafficking podcast brought to you by Our Rescue. I'm Matt Osborne, Global Ambassador for Operations and Education. And here on the road, just outside of Indianapolis, Indiana, with Todd Jordan, who is the owner and program developer and chief trainer at Jordan Detection K9. The reason we're here this week, as you know, is because this is something you haven't done before, right? An advanced deployment strategies and tactics course. I know you're running about five classes a year, I think normal. So talk to me a little bit about what's different about this class. What makes it advanced? Who have you invited? And what we're gonna get to see over the next couple of days. I can't wait. So we, usually, we do have five new handler classes a year. Um, we also have like nine or 10 recertifications. So basically every dog that gets certified, they have to pass a test. And those tests sometimes take a lot, little bit longer. We do uh, room searches, we do vehicle searches, outside area searches, water searches, and things like that. So they have to jump through a lot of hoops to get that one initial certification. Well, we don't stop there. We want the dogs to be proficient all the time. So we wanna make sure that the handler's doing what it's supposed to do. The dogs didn't pick up any bad habits. So mm -hmm. we'll have them come back and do a recertification every year. And those last three days, but what we're finding is, is that we're, we train the new handlers on basic things, then they go back to their office. These dogs aren't everywhere yet. And so they have a hard time finding other individuals that have ESD dogs okay. to train with. So they're trying to train with the pointy ear dogs and that just doesn't go very well yeah. because it's completely different. Drug odor, explosive odors are so strong and these odors are so minute, you have to work your dog completely different than right. just to get them into an area where um, several devices might be. It's not just one big pile of drugs that, or one bomb. You might find an SD card in one drawer and then three drawers down or right. one piece of furniture next, there might be 10 more over there. So you have to be able to find everything. So going through a recertification class, going through a new handler class, we weren't really getting any advanced type class because we're spending too much time getting the dogs certified and testing them and making sure that they're fine, right. that handlers were coming back to us and saying, we would really like some advanced training. And so we wanted to make sure that it was gonna be offered to everybody, but I was like, you know, I didn't want another avenue to try to collect money from OUR to have this done. Yeah, I said, yeah, listen, if, if we could do this class, but don't, don't pay for the handlers to come here. Let the departments pay. They, they've asked for this. This isn't a, a thing where I, I, I love that OUR wants to be a part of this, mm -hmm. and you can be, but I don't want you guys to have to be out more money for this. Let's just try to have this class, and the departments are asking for it, so let them pay for some. Let them have some buy-in yeah. for the, the donation that you guys already give them. And they were like, okay, well, that's fine, I guess, but they really wanted to help out other agencies, and, um, and that's fine too. But um, so this class basically is all scenario based. They're basically giving four search warrants a day and starting tomorrow, um, they will be giving uh, four search warrants. We split, there's 24 teams here. Okay. And so 24 dogs and 24 handlers. And um, basically they're going to be split into teams of six, I believe. And they're going to be run through four search warrants. Okay. And the search warrants are pretty intense. Um, there's some that are, you know, that have multi, multi rooms. There's uh, a stalking case that we've, and most of the case, most of the scenarios are things that handlers have, have found okay. and have worked and we're just using the cases they've already been, um, they've gone through the courts and everything so we can use the scenarios. Sure. And On these scenarios, have they said, Todd, we went through this and our dog had trouble with it, we need some help, or just we're starting to see a lot of these cases, therefore, can you please put us through this because this is maybe the future of trafficking cases that we're gonna see in the US? Yeah, I mean, just like air tags, we, we had no idea that the, the tiles and the Apple air tags and all those that the dogs could indicate on that, but um, Chaz and Spike, they, they found the first one and it was, it was one of those things that was in a car. A, a, a woman, I think, pulled up to the police station and said, I, I'm, I think my estranged is following me. He, they know too much information. Could you search the car? So Chaz just took it upon himself to bring his dog out to see if they could find anything. And he located a, an air tag that was hidden underneath the carpet of the floorboard of the, and she had no idea. The carpet wasn't cut. I mean, it was, yeah. it was in the guy actually in, installed carpet over the air tag where she couldn't find it. A stalker case, right? So that kind of thing, stalker case. I imagine trafficking victims will have oftentimes air tags put into backpacks, clothes, whatever, knowingly or unknowingly. 
So on these scenarios, if we promise to embargo this until after either your handlers go through, so they're not getting any bit of, uh, of head start or cheating, can you tell us some of the details of these scenarios? Uh, the stalker one we talked about as well, but again, tell me a little bit too about the basement, the maze, some of the things you showed earlier. That, that freaked me out in a good way, meaning this is gonna be incredible. Yeah, so the Hope Center, it's a huge, it's an old hospital, so they have tunnels under here that are kind of creepy in its own way, especially at night, but they run from one building to the next, so there's a lot of you know, hidden areas in there. So the security person that's in charge over here at the Hope Center, she's told us that they have another level. And so we went over and checked it out a few months ago and said, this is perfect. So it's basically, we're going to make like a human trafficking type you know, tunnel, like they're going under the border or whatever. And, and that the, the person that's being trafficked has not only a cell phone in their pocket, but they have an air tag in their backpack. Okay. Um, and so we actually have, it's, it's kind of a homicide investigation at the same time. So we have a mannequin um, down there as well. So we put a mannequin in the tunnel mm -hmm. and we put an air tag in a backpack that's strapped to them and it's gonna be like a homicide. So then the phone's still gonna be in the pocket or the person's laying there that's passed away. I don't know if it's a, exactly a homicide or what's going on with it. Something you have to figure out which is morbid, but unfortunately all too realistic, correct? Absolutely. Trafficking victim dies or is killed. Well, let's just leave her or leave him, let's go on. But that happens and the dog will have to deal with that. Even in the fire service, when we go to a fatal fire, the dogs really take that with them. They actually, you know, they get it, they just get as upset about it as we do. So to have that, we really can't train on that. So the only way we thought about doing this with a mannequin is the dog's not gonna really know that that's supposed to be a person. Right. So how can we get the dogs to where they will actually go up and actually be distracted? Because bodies distract dogs. At, yeah. I mean, at least they do at the fire scene and, and some of the homicide investigations that the handlers have been on, they've, they've said that the dogs get really creeped out with the, and get a little nervous if a human died here. So the only way we can really set that up is we're going to add food to the body and because that will draw the dogs to it because the, the dog will just walk right by a manic and they're not gonna know what it's supposed to be. Um, so we're going to add food to it just to get the dogs to be distracted over to the body and maybe, you know, hopefully they will find the air tag and not the hamburger that's going to be in the for pocket. Sure. And again, with such a dark topic and you've worked so many for years, we say if you don't laugh, you'll cry, right? So right. I did chuckle a little bit when I thought this dog tomorrow, it's going to be a little unfair, but I know why. They're supposed to be sniffing out the TPPO, mm -hmm. but you're going to have some good smelling cheeseburgers around, right. right? Or hamburgers right. here for them. Yeah, so that, and that's the only way we think we could think of that, that would distract the dogs well enough to, you know, maybe throw the handlers off a little bit. And because it's an advanced class, we do want to mess with them and yeah. we're going to put them in some situations. Another case we have is we're finding out that these dogs are not only great for the child exploitation cases and human trafficking cases, but even homicide investigations and even, well, explosives now too. I mean, people use cell phones as a, a triggering device for, for a bomb or something. Right. So. That's one of the cases where I actually set up a scenario to where the dog will find what looks like a pipe bomb, but when they get close to it, there's a note attached to it and it tells them that, okay, great, you've just triggered the device. You have five minutes to find the real device. And oh, so wow. they have to go in and we're putting Chaz in charge of that. <laughs> yeah. And we're gonna play loud music and actually make it very stressful for them as they go through and they're only gonna have five minutes to find the actual device. And we have a bunch of dummy devices um, laying around in this room as well. So. You guys will get to see that this week too. And we appreciate the opportunity to be here to see this. And again, as you mentioned, these 24 teams, four search warrants, they're gonna have to go warrant to warrant to warrant to warrant, right? Mm -hmm. Making their reports as well. And then at the end, kind of debriefing on what they found and what they haven't. So yeah. it certainly seems like this is advanced and it'll be amazing for these men and women who are on the front lines every single day fighting child exploitation and human trafficking. Yeah, that's great. So as we start to wrap up, I just, again, have so many questions still, but to think about where you started in your garage, right, until now where we are, I think you mentioned you've trained 143 of these dogs, correct? Correct. And we in our rescue are so grateful that I think the last number I saw is that thanks to our donors and our supporters, we've been able to sponsor 98 of these dogs. We understand other groups are getting involved as well, which we love. We're not just one organization that says, no, only us, no one else. This is everyone. We all have to fight this. But would you mind as we wrap up to give our audience a little bit of an understanding of how much these dogs cost, the initial dog training for the years you put in, then the handler, 
and then what it's meant to partner with Our Rescue and other groups to allow you to get these dogs into, you mentioned ICAC, Internet Crimes Against Children Task Forces, and other department, police departments and sheriff's offices around the U.S. and around the world. Yeah, so I mean, with the 143 dogs that we have out there, I mean, you have 98 of them come from OUR, it's fantastic. I mean, um, the cost of the dog, is, it includes the training with it, it's 15,000. Um, and then what we do on top of that is, um, what OUR does on top of that, is they pay for the handler to get here. They pay for the travel, they pay for their hotel, they pay for food, I believe. So they go way above and beyond what other places do um, and having all that. So I think the total cost is what for one team is like 22,000 yeah. to 25,000, something like that, um, of what OUR pays to have a, have a team put in, in place in a law enforcement. And I think the biggest thing that's, that's I think is funny because when I call people and, or they call me and they're, they're saying, hey, we really want one of these dogs. And, they, and I send them a, just a, kind of a Reader's Digest version of the, of the program, but I put in there that, you know, OUR actually will, you know, don donate the dog. And they're like, well, what's the catch? Exactly. And I'm like, there's really there's no, no catch. catch. Right. I mean, all they want you to do is report back to them to tell the donors to say, you know, we went on 10 search warrants this month. We've arrested eight people and we've, or, and we've rescued three kids. Yeah. And they don't care if it was John Doe or John Smith or Jared Fogle. They don't care. It's just they want the statistics because the donors want to know. I mean, it's, I mean they're investing in OUR. They're investing in these dogs. So it, it's only right to be able to say, hey, the dog that you donated, has gone out and has found, rescued this many kids and arrested this many people. Yeah, and for sure. And we want the police department, sheriff's offices, task forces to have these dogs. And, and what Todd says is absolutely right. We don't want the credit. We want the credit for the men and women on the ground, uh, you know, fighting this. But we want to know what they've been able to do. And it is incredible. I think the last stat that we've seen is that our dogs, and again, this is with Todd and Jordan Detection Canine, have about an 83% find rate now. And remember, as we said, some of these are secondary searches, tertiary searches, just incredible. So for those of you maybe thinking about, well, what do my $5 a month do or $25 a month? Every little bit helps. That's how we've been able to take donations, pull them together, and fund 98 of these dogs. And we're so grateful. Maybe to wrap up on a positive note, if you would, uh, maybe one emblematic case you might think of, either a dog that's found something in a place that would blow the minds of our audience, a dog sniffed out a device there, or finishing too, and what you and I talked about, how these dogs are detection dogs, but they're also comfort dogs, therapy dogs, not only for the survivor herself or himself oftentimes, but what it does to a police department, a sheriff's office, a task force, when the handler comes in, yeah, they're happy to see him or her, but quickly it's like, Where's your dog? Where's the dog? You no longer exist once you get a dog. They're always like, <laughs> oh, hey, dog, and then they don't ever say anything to the investigator. Right. But um, well, some of the biggest cases, I mean, I, I think for me, um, every case, if you can find a micro SD the size of a fingernail, that's pretty huge, and especially yeah. when you have that much on, you know, if you go into a hoarder. These houses aren't like normal clean houses. These are hoarder houses. These are pretty disgusting, really. And so to be able to go into all that filth and nastiness and and be able to find one micro SD that that to me is just phenomenal but you know they've taken it a step further I mean they're finding stuff in ceilings um, you know eight feet ten feet up in the air That's um, incredible. it's just That's yeah incredible. it's just it, it's amazing but probably the biggest thing that has amazed me is the underwater searches and again somebody from the United Kingdom called me and says can your dogs find something underwater and I said I don't know, give me an hour. I got five dogs in training and I have a, a creek or a creek, however you want to say yeah. it, wherever you're, whatever <laughs> right. part of the country you're with. Um, but I have a creek in my backyard and I threw a phone out there and, and just, and I let it sit for like 15, 20 minutes and I went out there and the, it wasn't, the current wasn't moving and, and I just took the dog off a leash and just let the dog work around the banks and sure enough, that dog went down and then went right into the water and, you know, indicated on the phone. Wow. I was like, Okay, they can. So mm -hmm. let's see how how deep we can go. Wow. And so we've taken it. I think the deepest we've gotten is like 24 to 48 inches. Um, one of the dogs actually went on a search warrant, and I think you mentioned this, so you must have heard the story already. The story, so yeah. um, they were looking for the suspect's cell phone, and she had the dog out in the backyard, and the dog walked over to the koi pond, which was four feet deep, and mm -hmm. sat and indicated on the koi pond. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they drained the koi pond, and sure yeah. enough, they found the suspect's phone. And at first, I heard that the other team around the handler said, we're not going to drain the pond. And the handler said, 
I trust my dog. I know there's something there, yeah, wasn't it? And had to insist, and then sure enough, they drained. Yeah, that, it, there's still a lot of non-believers out there, so um, it's always funny when they get put in their place by the handler. And usually, it's usually it's the female handlers that are adamant about it, and they're mm -hmm. just there's we we trust our dog, exactly. and, and that's exactly what happened. So that's incredible. We found the cell phone because the suspect was running and just threw it in the pond and ran, mm -hmm. and so to retrace his steps. This is incredible. I think that one other case that I can think of was here in Indiana, and it was a homicide investigation where there was a home invasion, um, and they killed the two people, the old people that were living there, and they had zero suspects. Well, they pinged the, one of the victim's cell phone, and it was in this wooded area, and when you ping a cell phone, you get like a quarter mile radius, and that's about as much as you can get. And they had searched it for days. Well, they remembered that, they, hey, we have a dog that can mm -hmm. find a cell phone. Let's call it in. So they did. Within 10 minutes, they found the phone. And the cool thing about it was the suspect's fingerprint was on that phone. And, that and that's the only it. thing that they had to get that suspect. And, of course, he'd been arrested before because usually you don't start out with murder. You start out with little crimes exactly. first. So they had actually got that guy based on the fingerprint that the dog found on that phone. To think how many hours search parties had gone through that quarter mile radius and you yeah. bring the dog in, the dog finds it. Besides rescuing kids and, and doing all that, it's just the man hours too. I mean, there's been times I've walked in with one, all the dogs I have in training, I take to search warrants. Mm -hmm. I still get to go and, and work the dogs and all that. But I remember one case, I went down to this basement and it was stacked floor to ceiling. And they're like, you probably don't want to bring your dog down here. It's not a great situation. I'm like, I drove two hours. I'm, I'll, I'll at least go in there. And we went in within five minutes, the dog indicated in this big pile. And I, I said, show me. And they pointed with their nose to the exact location. And I pulled out this box and there were SD cards just full of it. And mm -hmm. one of the state troopers came in and she said, it would have taken, she said, we probably would have never found it. And if we would have found it, it would have been days because of all the time just to get to that one little box in this millions of boxes that were in this basement and the dog so, found it yeah within 10 minutes yeah and you remember one of the dogs you trained he do and mm -hmm. we took yeah. he do to mexico city with us and there was a suspect who lived in an apartment in the most rancid conditions just disgusting and in a disgusting pile of laundry the suspect had hidden a hard drive and a cell phone he do came in and found it you know the rest of the team's covering their nose masking up and these dogs will find it so Todd, thank you so much. Thanks for having us out here. I'm so excited for the next few days. It's going to be amazing to see these men and women in action, but thank you for taking this time to tell us a little bit about your program, and thanks to you as well for watching and listening to this episode of Voices for Freedom, an anti-trafficking podcast. We need you, please, to like this podcast, to share, to help us promote, to get these messages out so that each week these heroes we're featuring uh, can have their stories told. Thank you. Please tune in next week to Voices for Freedom, an anti-trafficking podcast brought to you by Our Rescue. Thanks for listening. Did you enjoy this episode? If so, please leave us a review and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have ideas for future episodes, email us at voicesforfreedom at ourrescue.org. Lastly, we encourage you to join the fight. Make a difference today by donating at ourrescue.org or text PODCAST to 75004. Again, that number is 75004.